Hello, um, I'm Esther. Uh, I just graduated. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna use the mic because I had pneumonia like two months ago and my voice is still not fully back, so I'm sorry. Um, but I, uh, so I'm presenting the Seattle Community Network, a nonprofit DIY infrastructure project, um, which I term a community learning network. Um, in my thesis, which uh, please don't read, but you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, my backward background is in community networks, uh, networks owned and or operated by a community, um, you know, very vague, varied definition, but in some kind of grassroots or participatory way. How many of you would say that you have been involved with community networks before in some way? Yeah, this is, the, this is a great crowd. Um, so this, this is back, this was my first community network project um, in 2012 in Tanzania. Um, we hooked up a rural school that was like totally off grid, seven kilometers away from the nearest town. Um, and uh, we, this, this was kind of, you know, a very experimental project where um, we were just seeing how we could get this school um, internet access and we ended up taking one of those little um, 3G modems at the time and opening it up um, and putting like a wire in it to um, make it a stronger receiver is essentially at attaching an antenna um, and then hooking up eventually a, like a giant antenna instead of a wire to that circuit board. Um, so uh, that, that was cool. We got basically cellular service from a city all the way uh, over in the countryside. Um, so over the years I have worked on a number of different community networks. This um, is one in the Philippines which was actually a cellular network. So this is a 2G cell network with a base station up here um, which I worked on with a, a a giant team. I basically tagged along with the University of Philippines um, Wireless Communications Engineering Laboratory, and they deployed this. So this is a whole academic field for those of you who don't know. Um, you know just how to deploy networks for um, kind of small, rural, remote communities um, in like rugged settings in ways that will survive. Like people can maintain these themselves. And so some other community networks in the world, um, so there's, there's the Detroit Equitable Internet Initiative. I'm, I'm from the US, I'm from Seattle. Um, and so you know, I know the most about the US network. So there's Detroit, NYC Mesh. Um, in Europe, there are some uh, very famous ones like Fryfunk and Guifi. Um, and then in Africa, Tunapanda Net, Zenzeleni, um, Libra Mesh in Argentina. How many of you have intersected with these folks in some way? Yeah, I, like the D-Web community has a pretty good community networks contingent, so that's very nice. So I worked with NYC Mesh a lot. These are two installs um, I was on because I am from New York City and that's kind of how I got involved with them. Um, and you know, NYC Mesh is quite big, so this is actually a screenshot from uh, many years ago, but now they have, um, I, I think, upwards of uh, almost a thousand nodes, maybe. Um, but yeah, it's so it's you know very it's growing quite fast. Um, they have thousands of people on their Slack uh, server. So uh, yeah, it's just it's a very good, vibrant community, community of practice. That's kind of what my my thesis was about. Um, and then, you know, there are other types of community networks, like the Detroit network is uh, much more kind of nonprofit based and they are uh, very digital equity focused. So um, they, you know, the network calls itself the Equitable Internet Initiative um, and they explicitly, they work with churches and like low income neighborhoods and they have these hubs where they serve internet access to people. And so this is a very um, you know, inspiring documentary. If you haven't seen it, this is like really great. Um, it's a Vice uh, video about how um, they, they train uh, people from the communities called digital stewards. Have you heard of that term before? Yeah, and they um, basically uh, train these people to connect their communities um, using you know, pretty like affordable equipment, um, usually fixed wireless, like unlicensed, um, you know, internet that can be just like much faster and more affordable than what they have access to in the cities. So uh, you can kind of see that, you know, internet access, like that's the broader problem I work on. Um, it's often an equity problem, especially that there's, you know, equity 
problems within the cities where um, you know people can't afford internet access even though it's possible there and then there's you know rural remote people who don't even have access to the infrastructure um, and so one of the things that as I work on you know building community networks that's what the the kind of methodology that I use and one of the things that's so empowering about building networks uh, especially you know as a group like with your local with, with a local team is that infrastructure is used to do other things so you know uh, this is the type of infrastructure that um, we all use for the internet. These are like undersea cables, fiber optic cables. Many people don't know how these are built or what they look like, but they use them all the time. People are critically dependent on this. Um, but you know, at the same time, there are other types of infrastructure which are even like there are layers, layers on top of this physical infrastructure, um, like GitHub. These are platforms, right? Software infrastructure. This is also infrastructure. And when you build, when you, when you self-host something like this, right, you are building something that you are doing other things on top of. And so that itself, you're, um, it, it gives you a mode of you know, helping somebody else get critical things done, like important things for them. And so um, it's very empowering to, to build infrastructure because you know you're having an effect on somebody else, someone else's capabilities. You're like enhancing your own capabilities, someone else's capabilities. And conversely, it's important, you know it's important because when your infrastructure fails, they hate you. <laughs> they, they come after you, they get angry because they cannot do the thing that they're trying to do. Right? And so, um, and, you know, part of my, my thesis, kind of the theoretical portion, is that infrastructuring changes socio-material reality. Um, and so that's part of, you know, why it's so empowering. Like, setting up a cell network allows you to communicate and, like, keep in touch with your family and do all these things you care about. Um, even their social infrastructure, like, you set up a weekly meeting to continue working on a project. You build relationships, and that is infrastructure for other things to happen on. And, you know, you repair your car to get places. So um, that is kind of, uh, you know, that is this infrastructure theory. Um, and so, I, I guess, again, part of my background, um, I started doing this work because I joined, uh, or, you know, after the, um, I initially got interested in internet access, um, I joined this ICTD, Information and Communication Technology for Development Lab at the University of Washington with my two professors. And it, basically, they work on internet connectivity and specifically, um, thinking about like in the global sense, you know, internet penetration has been going up, but overall the rate of, of change has been slowing. So there's this like long tail of people who are slowly getting left behind. You know, they're um, people who might have been connected on only 2G networks for a long time, and now like 2G networks are maybe not supported anymore because all of the operators upgrading 3G, 4G, 5G, et cetera. So, um, you know, people are getting left behind, and this was the idea behind community cellular networks. Like, even in these rural areas, you could um, deploy these networks on trees, um, and you could have, like, essentially micro base station, like micro cells um, that would serve a small rural village. And so we've done an, a lot of these projects um, over the years. This is Indonesia, got the Philippines, this one is in Mexico. Um, this one, sorry, I, I'm mousing, but I realize that that's not, <laughs> that's not showing up. Um, so Indonesia, Philippines, Mexico. Um, this one is in Seattle. This is actually a picture of um, teaching this stuff, like how to run cellular networks at a boot camp in San Diego. Um, and this is, I think, uh, northern Canada, where um, my uh, professor and a postdoc were deploying there. Sorry? Oh, OK. So um, I guess we, I, I mentioned that we have a project in Seattle, the Seattle Community Network. Um, so Seattle is actually, you know, in the grand global scheme of things, really well connected. And so this was kind of a statistic that was coming out in 2018. There was like a broadband study um, that 
talked about how 95% of Seattleites have access to the internet. Um, you know, a lot of this study was actually done by surveying people online, so I think that there was probably a little, <laughs> a little wrong there. But you know, um, <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about these biases in a second. Um, so you can see they, they did these studies um, of like equity, uh, where people are um, more were more likely to be without internet access if they were li like living in poverty. Um, you know, according to certain like threshold definitions, household member living with a disability, primary language other than English, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, of course, uh, you're like, oh, this is this is expected. Like, I, you know, this makes sense. Um, and so, in order to try and patch like gaps in people's internet access, you do want to go after these specific target demographic groups. Um, and in 2023, uh, they did a recent, uh, you know, 2023, 2024 broadband adoption study as well. And so now they're like, oh, you know, 2% of people don't have internet at home. Um, and then, so if you're thinking about how well are people covered, like if, if there's a network outage somewhere, do people have a backup? Because that's really important now too, um, after, after um, things have moved online uh, largely since, since COVID started. So 50% of residents have both cellular and broadband providers. Um, these numbers are interesting because, you know, from, from about 5%, no internet at home, um, or yeah, no internet at all, uh, now it's two percent, and so um, you have. We do see a lot. A lot has changed in terms of rollout of internet access. There's more fiber now. All the internet service providers took, you know, federal money and like rolled out more infrastructure. Um, and at the same time, this. Um, so, uh, in since the last the 2018 study, the definition of broadband actually changed that they used for these studies. So back, um, they were using 25 megabits down, three up um, in 2018. And for this study, they were actually using 50 down, um, and I forget how many up, but I think it was fi like 50 down, three up or something. And then um, now the federal broadband definition is 100 down, 20 up. It just changed this March. So, um, you know, people are recognizing that these goalposts need to change as um, pretty much, you know, applications get more bandwidth intensive and websites get bigger and like, um, you know, the complexity of web things increases and also people's streaming needs. Um, but it's, it's interesting, like, uh, the actual problems here, it seems, are like the costs. And this is part of the equity issues and that's why, I mean, recognizing, um, you know, since, since I'm in this field that thinks about equity and internet access, um, we, we sort of realize that it's, it's not the, the, the possibility of getting internet access often, it's just the cost. Um, and that's why there are so many equity issues, like even within cities. Um, so, you know, m most Seattle households are paying, paying at least $100 a month, um, two out of five are pay paying at least 150 per month. That's not compatible with poverty. Um, and so we have the Seattle Community Network Project. Um, we want to deploy infrastructure to give free internet um, for those who can't afford to pay for service or devices um, or who don't know how to connect to access networks. But at the same time, we had this vision of, since I, I was at a university when we started this project, um, we wanted like I wanted to do this kind of as service learning, right? I wanted to do this for my graduate studies um, and also recruit other tech workers who I knew wanted to do something to make a difference. Um, but also, you know, there's one thing uh, that's maybe satisfying about doing like political advocacy and like, you go to city council meetings and you say, hey, we need like better internet or like more, you know, stringent regulations on these ISPs. But like um, most of us don't, really want to do that. I mean, it's, it's great, it's important, but like, um, you know, get, like what we get joy out of in life is probably not that. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I feel like there's, there's this bias, at least among tech people that I know, of preferring the direct action, like the ability to like sit down and do things um, with your hands or like at a keyboard and, and actually take action on things. And so that's kind of the methodology that I prefer personally. Um, 
And so we, we do this, like, um, we build infrastructure. We learn how to build infrastructure as we do it. We train people. So we've got these digital stewards programs, um, which we modeled after the Detroit programs for youth and adults. Um, we, uh, I guess, it's, it's interesting, the role of the, the community network. We build and deploy physical infrastructure in the city, or in both Seattle and Tacoma, and that infrastructure becomes real life experiences for people who are trainees. And so there's this ecosystem of nonprofits that we are connected and partnered with, and um, they often have their training programs that they get funded through grants, and so we are the practicum. They like um, come and work with us as volunteers, and so we'll deploy these networks together. This guy is actually um, a resident of, I'll, I'll talk about this in a second, but we serve a lot of um, unhoused people who are maybe transitioning out of houselessness and um, low-income housing. And so sometimes we get the residents themselves who are like, oh yeah, I'm an electrician. Like I will you know, hook up my own house. And so um, I find that it has, um, it, together we have these values of doing collaborative technical work and building social solidarity and cohesion across like these many different intersections of like socioeconomic positionality. Um, so these are just some pictures from our different training and education programs. So like we, um, I feel like pedagogy is one of these like core elements of our network and we're trying to build a community of practice here among all these different people. We got a broadband technicians class um, that was, uh, that, that's currently at the Filipino Community Center where we have a network site. Um, the digital Stewards Program, which was run with the Black Brilliance Research Project and Youth Digital Stewards. Um, and then on, um, on this picture, we have actually a college class that we taught, which was about community networking. And they're doing testing in front of um, a tiny house village, which is like a kind of emergency shelter we have in Seattle. Right. And so there's also an, another interesting um, intersection here where a bunch of us teach for the Tribal Broadband Boot Camp, which is another like, um, it's a training initiative for tribes that want to run their own ISPs. So like part of this community of practice now, right? We have all these nerds who like want to build network equipment and we just want like, you know, all of the, you know, tribal folks to also be part of our community, right? Like we just want to have, like um, share that solidarity. And so, um, you know, we'll go and essentially have like a hands-on boot camp about um, both, it's both wireless and fiber um, and things like digital equity, you know, all these elements that it takes to run um, a, an ISP. This, this is actually in the center. Um, this is a crazy demo that I'd never seen before, how they like str um, run, uh, like uh, aerial fiber. Yeah, how they like strap the fiber to these like support poles and there's this like contraption that does it um, and you know, fiber splicing and all that. Um, so yeah, we, uh, you know, I personally teach a lot. This is like an example of one class that I taught very early on um, for the Digital Stewards program where we're like, okay, this is how you mount. And uh, it, we, we were doing like a wireless mast for, um, for an antenna. And so we partnered with this maker space called Alt Space. Um, and they were like, yeah, you can mount a pole to our wall. So we did that. <laughs> And then we were like, okay, this is a wall-mounted mast. This is like a gable mount. You know, based on what, what kind of structure you have, you will have to decide what kind of mounts. And it, it becomes very physical. And you have a lot of people who are into construction who are like, oh yeah, I know how to do this. Like, yeah. Um, and at the same time, you have uh, we we have this vision where we actually get research grants to help do this stuff because um, we can make kind of architectural innovations even on. Um, the cellular network core. So, and so we, we can test out like many different aspects of um, kind of cellular networks using our open source tooling. So um, we are deploying in, the first thing is CBRS. Um, have, has anyone heard of that, CBRS? Um, so this is more of a US you know, policy thing. So uh, recently, since like 2018, um, we, the, the FCC has allowed us, um, the general public, to have access to um, a 3.5 gigahertz spectrum called Citizens Broadband Radio Service. 
Um, and so this is, I, I guess I'll talk a little bit more about it in a second, but um, basically the general public can have access to this like semi-licensed spectrum. So all you have to do is take a test, get a license, it's kind of like a ham license, but um, it's more expensive test. Uh, but you can get a license to be able to register devices and transmit on this, this newly open spectrum. Um, so we were testing that, we were testing, we had like an open source software project that um, made use of uh, an open source cellular core called Open5GS. Um, we also had this decentralized authentication um, scheme for this core that would allow like federation of different cellular core networks without um, roaming agreements. So that, all of those are like kind of academically fruitful results that can make use of this kind of community infrastructure. Um, and at the same time, we've got you know, workforce development, curriculum development um, type uh, goals that we can pursue. So that's another kind of funding, um, potential funding source. So I'll give some examples of research that we have done um, that piggyback off of, of the um, SCN project. Um, so to, to make things a little more concrete about the physical access network that we built in Seattle, um, we partner with community centers. So like, for example, like the Filipino Community Center, we've got a cell site on top of that building um, that provides a, a 4G LTE wireless network. And we have um, these receivers, it kind of like hotspots. If any of you have, you know, um, some kind of like fixed wireless hotspot in your, in your house um, that just has a SIM card in it, and that's the same type of network we have. Um, so we use a CBRS, it's called LTE Band 48, that's a spectrum band that we use. And um, so these LTE modems, they're also called customer premises equipment. Um, they receive the internet access, they have a SIM card in them, and um, they provide a connection to whatever Wi-Fi router is in the home. So that's how people get internet access. Um, and you know, just to clarify about the, the wireless frequencies, this is the FCC, um, US FCC chart of frequencies. Um, and so this is the, uh, how the Citizens Broadband Radio Service band works. Um, it's dynamically licensed, so um, the, there's like um, a allocation of, the, of like channels in this frequency band by tiers. So this band used to be used by satellite service, US Navy radar, um, but uh, then it got recycled so that um, they could auction off a bunch to these priority access license holders. So ISPs um, got to buy priority access to about half of the spectrum. But then um, there is also a general tier. So if a priority license holder is not requesting a particular piece of the spectrum, then anyone with a license can register a device, um, sign it with their license, and say, I want my device to transmit in this location with these specific specifications for transmit power and you know antenna type and everything. Um, and then they can get allocated a, a little chunk of spectrum to transmit in. Um, so this is actually very nice, and I, I hope Canada will like you know have this kind of slightly open, more open spectrum someday because that would help a lot of you know I I know like tribal ISPs and things like that, uh, but smaller groups who are trying to um, transmit on wireless frequencies. Uh, so in Seattle, these are our current cell sites. We've got Filipino Community of Seattle, Garfield High School, Franklin High School, Skyway Library. Um, there's a co-working space called Surge Tacoma. And then we've got two more um, sites, like kind of in the works due to a um, National Science Foundation grant. So this is a research grant doing um, emergency infrastructure. So we're looking at using these open source, community owned and operated cell sites to kind of support connectivity. They'll work for local connectivity, like in a neighborhood, even if, you know, in general, cell networks are down because of an earthquake or something. Um, so this is a picture of our deployment um, process on Skyway Library, and you can see that, you know, it's a lot of people who are kind of teaching each other, like teaching one another how to crimp, 
um, Ethernet cable, and you know we're all working together. So this is not a typical construction site, but it is more um, of both like a training exercise and uh, deployment. And so we've got um, in this this particular research project, we've got two kind of sister deployments: one in North Seattle with a bunch of ham radio nerds, um, and in a affluent neighborhood, and then we've got one in Westport, which is a lower income area um, with kind of less capacity, like emergency resilience capacity, so we're trying to build capacity um, and sort of build a shared community of practice between the two. Um, but, you know, the, the whole, um, the Seattle Community Network project, we started in 2019, just before the pandemic, and it was kind of, you know, both an infrastructure building exercise and envisioned as a way to find gaps and needs for connectivity in Seattle. So one of the biggest findings that we've actually had since then is that um, the people we need to serve are often unhoused. Now, this might seem obvious, but, um, you know, back when we were reading those statistics about 95% of people, are, you know, have internet access, uh, we, we actually weren't necessarily aware of, uh, like, who in Seattle ha doesn't have internet access. It turns out that, um, you know, many of those people are not counted even in the 95% of, in, in the total people who are surveyed, because they cannot be called necessarily to be surveyed or um, reach, you know, a web browser to, to fill out a survey. Um, and so unhoused people are frontline communities for both environmental conditions. They, environmentalists talk about this all the time, how they're more exposed to like smoke and heat and all that, uh, but also lack of infrastructure. So we ended up partnering with this um, organization called Nicholsville in Seattle um, and, other, and other orgs that run tiny house villages like Low Income Housing Institute. So Nicholsville, for example, is a self-managed and organized tiny house village nonprofit. So they build these tiny houses, which are transitional housing. They're like emergency shelter, where um, unhoused people can come in and live there um, until they have built up the capacity to move out. Uh, yeah, and <laughs> so uh, we actually, we hadn't, we hadn't done this before uh, yesterday. Yesterday we did our first site survey of an actual like tent encampment, which is run by another organization called SHARE. Um, and they have, Nicholsville and SHARE have a, a strong partnership, so they referred us. Um, and so now we are going to try to do some encampments as well. Um, basically, these are the um, tiny house, or the, these are the kind of low-income housing sites we have in total. Um, we've got Catherine's Place and Filipino Community Village. These are both low-income housing complexes. And this is actually uh, the type of site where we've got a cell tower, our own open source LTE cell tower, um, with our SIM cards and our little LTE modems. So that top small box up there, um, that is a customer premises equipment for 4G LTE. That's receiving signal from one of our towers. Um, and then we've got a Wi-Fi router there and um, broadcasting Wi-Fi network like throughout the tiny house village. Um, so this is how all of our early sites looked like. Um, but we found that some, there were some cases where tiny house villages actually, since they do have a street address technically, you can call the internet company and ask them to hook up fiber there. And so we asked um, the city of Seattle, we partnered with the city to get a free uh, fiber internet connection to a lot of these villages. And so this site, for example, in the picture, um, that started out as a CBRS LTE site and um, throughout, like sometime during the pandemic, you know, they, we had kept asking Lumen, the, one of the fiber companies, um, hey, can you service this location? Can you do this? And they had said no. And then all of a sudden, at one point, they deployed fiber on that street. And they were like, yes, we can serve this location. So as soon as they did that, we swapped it over onto fiber. And suddenly, they got like a gigabit um, bandwidth into their village. So now, wherever we can, we do deploy these networks on fiber. However, there are still a lot of areas where we can't. Um, and in those cases, we do things like put them on fixed wireless. So we'll have like a little modem that can, um, you can put in a you know, T-Mobile 5G SIM card. Um, and so we end up 
uh, like backhauling, backhaul meaning like the upstream internet connection, uh, we backhaul these off of, of fixed wireless, somebody else's fixed wireless if we can't get service there. But that, you know, we, we have also found that backhaul for these sites is almost typically the hardest problem. So these are the things that um, incur unavoidable recurring costs and uh, can limit your bandwidth. You also get things like DMCA um, complaints. <laughs> okay, so, uh, is it yes? Yeah, so you, that's typical, but you do Wi-Fi as the access, and then you do 4G as the backhaul. That's typical, right? Uh, yes, in uh, earlier we were doing, so we had a device giving program also with like cell phones. So we're giving um, cell phones with our SIM card with access to our network, but we found that because our um, access was patchy, like it was only in certain areas, um, people were swapping out our SIM cards for um, other providers. And you know that's fine because you use the device how it's useful to you. But um, we are actually working on a project right now, like uh, making eSIMs work on our network that would make the coverage kind of seamless with other carriers. So you could, it's, it's kind of like having dual SIMs. So you can switch onto the network that gives you free data when it's available. Um, so that would be pretty cool. Um, but I just wanted to um, you know, give you more of an idea of like what does it really look like to construct one of these tiny house village networks, which has been one of the most compelling use cases. And um, so now like most of our users are, are in these tiny house villages. Um, so for example, in Nicholsville CD, uh, these, you can't really see these well in the picture, but you, we've got these um, ubiquity like Unify AC Mesh Pros, which are just pretty nice outdoor um, wireless access point, or Wi-Fi access points um, deployed throughout the village. And then there's like cabling, like ethernet cabling between them. So, you know, it's, it's simple. Like most of you have probably deployed a network like this, but maybe not quite at the village scale. Um, it's as if you kind of had a big house. Uh, so you, uh, we have our ISP router here, and then we basically run power over Ethernet um, cables throughout the village. This is a heat map that we use the um, Unify. Uh, this, this type of gear you know, has a free web utility that can allow you to make a heat map. Um, so we do that, and so you'll see um, Faith is one of my digital steward students, and she is really awesome. Like, um, she you know makes her own install plans now, and so she did this in the Unify tool, um, and then we make a cable map. So, you know, we've got fun names for these routers, and we make a map of how the cables should be run in the village. Um, this is, of course, after we do a site survey. So, like, this is this is Faith and Malachi. Like, for example, um, this is the Lehigh Maple Leaf uh, Village where we did our second to last install. I think um, we usually start out with uh, we bring the internet connection into the office, which is like the most secure, you know, least. Um, obtrusive to the resident's location. And then uh, we'll often use like existing, you know, light cables um, to string up our ethernet. Um, the, uh, the most annoying thing is dealing with like the gaps between houses. Um, usually we can get away with stringing like ethernet along the eaves, um, but you know, we have to be careful that the gaps um, don't let the cables like hang too low for, um, above people's heads. So we have to do some planning there. We install the internet in the office, and then we run the ethernet cabling, we put up the, the access points. Um, so we start out with a you know, floor plan like this. Almost all of these villages have one, and then we'll just mark it up with where the, the cables should run, um, and then we go in and install. And um, yeah, so the, we have uh, quite a few of these tiny house villages now. And um, on top of that, we realized that we could do some research. So we have these um, NSF grants, as I said, uh, that, that help fund this work. And so um, we had, this is the Nicholsville Central District Network. Um, we actually added a project called Participatory Design of IoT in Tiny House Villages. Um, so I'd be interested in talking more about the um, uh, tactical like networking, but uh, this basically we're we're using IoT um, devices to, you know, help people out in the village with stuff that they that they need. Like um, for example, they mentioned that the um, 
they had some security problems in the village, so they were, we were like, oh, um, what do you need for that? And they were like, motion sensing lights and maybe like a door alarm and things like that. So we were, we were prototyping these things with them. Um, yeah, we did some participatory design workshops um, and we also did like a sensor hackathon with some of the folks in the village. And it turns out that, you know, sensor and IoT things are really good for hands-on like kind of STEM education. So people were really excited to learn how to um, work with technology more through working with these sensors. Okay, I, in the interest of time, um, I'm gonna skip a little bit, but it's just kind of, I, I like to have calls for action. And one of, one of these big findings, like, from all of my work is that um, communities of practice are really important in magnifying the social impact of technology and infrastructure projects. So, um, you know, wherever, wherever I can, uh, wherever I see opportunities to build communities of practice between people who otherwise, like, might be siloed in, in terms of their knowledge and expertise, like, I try to build those bridges. And then, um, you know, as tech workers, mo most of us have access to mobilizing power, resources, and infrastructure, um, and potentially for the benefit of others. So, like, where you can get resources from where you're at, um, you should look into doing that. And so, uh, we have ongoing work installing more tiny house villages internet. We're doing, like, IoT design iterations, technical development on our network. Um, I had an idea of maybe, I think, I think this is a little atypical, we only have a little bit of time, but if, if you can, if you have your computer, um, what we could do is I could show you very briefly how to use um, one of these like wireless link planner tools, which has been um, in previous you know, workshops I've taught, it has been like really eye-opening for people um, because it is really easy actually to get started designing a wireless network for your community. And so um, the kind of task is that we're trying to get internet connectivity to a particular place. Like for example, we had a site on top of Franklin High School, and this is actually this Google Earth image. This is a view of Franklin High School, like kind of in the foreground, and then in the background um, is a place, is Alt Space, the um, old hacker space that we had been trying to partner with to have a community network site. Um, that space actually didn't work out, but we were using Google Earth to try to see if um, we could make a wireless connection. Is there a line of sight? And so what we do is we use Google Earth Pro and we do a view shed analysis. Um, and that basically means like you put a pin in a geographic location, um, you put the pin at the height of the building that you're trying to deploy an antenna on, and then um, you map what you can see physically. Like what is your line of sight? What, what all can you see from that point? And so um, if you're your Google Earth has topo or uh, yeah topographical data and also like the building height data. It can calculate that for you. Um, so this is like one of the tools that I use regularly. But there is another tool actually that is a little bit um, easier and more accessible to use, and it kind of gets you um, thinking about the radio hardware that you're deploying as well. And so this um, site is actually a website that's now at um, let's see. Uh, yeah, ispdesign.ui.com. This is a particular company's tool, like a particular manufacturer. So this is kind of an advertising tool for them. And as much as I hate that, um, I do find it a, a useful demo tool just to kind of get started because they allow you to at least, um, they, they give you access to models of their own equipment in terms of how the wireless propagation works. So it's very interesting to play with for the first time. Um, so, yeah, can someone screen out to me the um, address of, of this place? Is that? Uh, <laughs> uh, there go. Yeah. And so, um, basically, what we can do is we can just add an access point here. And um, it, oh, goodness, the, the screen is a bad aspect ratio here. So um, I'm going to disable auto product selection. And then I'm going to say, OK, well, this is my building where I want to deploy an access point. And I'm going to deploy not this recommended product, but some other product that I like better. So this 
you can choose between any uh, number of products. And like, let's just say I want to choose this one. Oh, okay, I'll just. So it it's really you know. Well, let's deploy this 60 gigahertz um, access point, and then I want to provide service to like these locations. And basically, it will model for you whether those locations will have line of sight. Um, it grabs the topo data. It's not completely accurate, but um, basically, it kind of allows you to get started. You can adjust the heights of these points um, based on your building height and things like that. And so, um, yeah, if we had time, I, I'm not, I don't think we have time. Um, but if we had time, then you could just go on this website. You don't have to have a login or anything, and you just play around with the tool um, and uh, it kind of imagine or envision your community network. Yeah? So does red mean it doesn't work because it's too, too low down? You can't get it? No. Red, red means it's very good. Red means it's very good. So, like, this is uh, very strong. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it is really not the best UI. Um, <laughs> So also, like the angle of this, you can't actually ch you can't drag and drop it. So you kind of you have to turn it using this arrow, which is my least favorite thing about this tool. But it it does get you out the door. So um, yeah, I would recommend that if you're a complete beginner and you've never done this kind of thing before, then you you can even like check out the specs of all the equipment um, and. You know, as it is their marketing tool, they do they give you like a bill of materials and let you order from this. Um, yeah, so there's a checkout button, but you don't have to hit that. You can just look at the um, the equipment. Yeah, and so I that's kind of like my takeaway. Um, oh goodness, I lost access to my PowerPoint um, because Google Slide is not local <laughs> first. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I guess my presentation is over. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, my my takeaway is that community networks are accessible, and you can you know start doing them yourself. It's not that hard, and there's a, a huge community of people out there who will um, help you out and do it with you. So um, you know, at, over time, I have gotten to know like the most amazing people. Um, who are helping out our network, like those folks who are in the audience right now. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it, like you can join our, our Discord for Seattle Community Network, you can join the Slack for NYC Mesh, um, and people will help you out with anything you want to do. So um, yeah, that is uh, my presentation. I think we're still going to take a couple of questions. Um, so if anyone has one, I see one at the back. And sorry, we're still working with one mic, so I'm going to run. Oh, you might shout. So it's interesting. People have questions about this because Seattle is in a coastal area, and so and you know there is the um, the Navy in Bremerton, and also like Tacoma is also they've got a lot of naval activity. So we do occasionally get kicked off of our spectrum. However, so I um, I could actually show you there is a. No, yeah, and so what I was going to say is the outages caused by that are usually like a blip because they switch you onto a different channel. So if you look at the, um, the spectrum availability map, which they have in these database tools that you use to register your devices, um, you'll see like kind of a heat map of how many channels are available in what areas. And for the most part, it's almost all green. So like, uh, you know, most channels will be available. This isn't... I don't think it's very widely adopted by ISPs so far, or by cellular providers so far. So f maybe it's just in the early days, but right now we are not seeing a huge amount of competition. Um, but we do get kicked off pretty regularly and just like shifted onto another channel. And sometimes our users do see and experience that, um, but just a, a few minutes or you know at most an hour. Um, and once we had, because this is kind of an early stage, um, our manufacturer was doing something called a domain proxy, where it's like proxying our requests to this database to get spectrum. And that 
database or that proxy was down. <laughs> so our, we got kicked off, and then the proxy failed, uh, and that outage lasted for like two days. And we were like, "This is not acceptable." Um, but we were helpless because we, you know, that's our manufacturer, and we couldn't do anything about the hardware we were using. Yeah. Yeah, kind of. I mean, we are not at that <coughs> level of performance, I guess. Like we, so um, I, there are some people on our, um, in our volunteer group who are interested in like using, you know, quality of QoS or like cake and like algorithms to um, help with buffer bloat. But when we've tried deploying it, it hasn't affected the performance enough for us to really like care about adopting it too much yet. Um, yeah, we also, like, I feel like our backhaul links are not generally saturated enough that it makes too much of a difference, but, you know, we have people who are interested in playing with it so far. 